project, a project of the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Today is the 13th of June, 1984. I'm in Montreal interviewing Mr. David Weiss, who's had long experience at the Baron de Hirsch Institute in Montreal. Okay, to begin, Mr. Weiss, I wonder if you could tell us when and where you were born and a little bit about your background. I was born in New York City on the east side, um, just before the First World War. My parents were immigrants from Russia, and I was one of seven children who survived. I uh, was educated in the public schools of New York City, and when my family moved to the Bronx, I uh, had a very important experience as a youngster, namely uh, falling into the hands of the Bronx YMYWHA, a community center movement. That experience, my uh, encounters with the professionals uh, group leaders uh, was a very dynamic one in steering me into uh, social uh, work, uh, first on a volunteer basis and then uh, during the depression in terms of professional training. I fell into social work, so to speak, by virtue of falling into the Y where I wanted to play pool and bowl. Um, my education actually was at the College of the City of New York in those days when it was the poor man's uh, Harvard, a highly uh, competitive university where you need at least an average of 80% to survive. I managed. I even played football and uh, track. Uh, from then I went on, after a year or two trying the business world in the Depression, the middle 30s, I decided to go to social work and started part-time at the New York School of Social Work. Um, when they thought I was ready for a job, they discovered I needed an advanced degree and I was admitted. It was hard to get into the New York School at the time. <coughs> Excuse me, you, so you had, uh, did you get a bachelor's degree from the City College of Yes, New I York? got a Bachelor of Social Service. Bachelor of Social, right. right, okay, and then you moved on? And I, then I moved on uh, and went to the Graduate School of Social Work, uh, the New York School, on a part-time basis first because I'd been married in the meantime. I also went to the Jewish Theological Seminary to equip myself to be better trained for Jewish community center work, where I had grown up first as a member to leadership and then to uh, more professional functions. At that time, um, I couldn't uh, become a journalist with no jobs open. That was my first love, writing was. And so I went into social work because jobs could be plentiful during the Depression. We were very hard at the Depression. And when I went to the New York School of Social Work, it led me into the field of casework, mm -hmm. which was probably the most uh, highly technically uh, developed as compared with group work or community organization or social reform, which were contingent but not the center of the New York School. I uh, took to it like anybody trained or educated with biblical exegesis, in which I was. Casework is a form of interpreting and reinterpreting the meaning of meanings, I took to it like, like a duck to water. Mm -hmm. And I very quickly moved into family casework. And at the New York School, I had the unusual experience of being trained in a diagnostic or psychoanalytically oriented school, but placed in the Jewish Family Service Agency of Brooklyn, which was highly Ronkian. And if you remember the old days of ideological theories, the Ronkians were antagonistic to the psychoanalytic people. And I was caught this is more the, more the functional school? That's the functional school. Okay. So I studied diagnos diagnostic uh, material and practiced as a functionalist. Well, how did that work for you? Well, I was uh, fortunate. I was hired even before I graduated by the agency in which I was doing field work. I was a great accolade. I was highly excited about this. And uh, I realized that instead of preparing myself for writing, which was my in initial interest, I could, by living with people, not only find personal satisfaction in the craft that had artistry about it, but I also could be seeing life as it was really lived, you know, mm -hmm. potential material. And then I discovered that I had committed myself to a secular priesthood. I'm really jumping, in a sense from my initial motivation, which seemed contingent to the situation of uh, 
difficult employment prospects in journalism in the writing field. I continued with the nature of the competition to get a job. I took voluntary interests, leisure interests, and made it into a career. Mm -hmm. Of course, being married helped also. I needed to earn money. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. that's how I got to the New York School. That in itself is a story. I have been a Jewish kind of worker most of my life was not accepted by the Graduate School of Jewish Social Work in New York, uh, which was interesting because uh, I wasn't considered uh, reliable for the long haul. And they wanted to get people from other parts of the country. Later on I had the satisfaction of being asked if I wanted to go. By that time I had my graduate degree and I said, thank you, no. <laughs> and I have stayed longer in Jewish Social Work work than anybody else. <laughs> No, I was trained in the Protestant school. Yeah, I'd like to go back for just a minute, if I might. Uh, your your uh, your interest in writing uh, fascinates me because of my own uh, my own interests. And was there a commonality of purpose that you thought you uh, that you thought there might be between writing and social work? What similarities were there? Well, uh, <clears throat> social work dealt with the poor, the bewildered, the unhappy. That was my theory. The People, in other words, who were deprived. They have always been the subject of great literature. Hunger, for example, by Nut Hampson, which was one of my earliest uh, uh, readings that had great impact. Or the writings of uh, the Russians and the Germans dealt with uh, outcasts or have-nots. So going to work with them and for them gave me access to material which my own life provided but which I was too close to recognize was the substance of which dreams can be made or fantasies. So it sort of coincided. I, was, I think I was also motivated by the fact that despite my social science degree, I majored primarily in literature, mm -hmm. uh, particularly German literature for some reason. This was before Hitler's time. And I was terribly impressed by uh, a short novel by Thomas Mann, uh, Tony Oprugo was supposed to make a decision between committing himself to art and denying life, or living life at the sacrifice of art. It's a false uh, duality, as I think now, but I chose life. Mm -hmm. It sounds dramatic, but these were some of the things, the fantasies, the ideas that were prevalent at that time. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't sell insurance, there was no one to buy it. I couldn't get into a newspaper, too many people looking for a job. So I went into this part-time, and before long it grabbed me full-time. Mm -hmm. I've been at it for over 40 years. At the time that you went into uh, social work on, on a paid basis, it must have been shortly after the time that the uh, Social Security Act passed in the No, States. it was somewhat before. Mm. Actually, I was doing social work on a part-time basis or volunteer basis, I would say from the year 1933, mm. at which time I held five positions in New York City Jewish community agencies on a part-time basis earned me the substantial sum of $18 a week. Five positions at the same time? I worked at the Bronx Y in the Bronx, the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan, the Astoria Jewish Center in Astoria, and somewhere in Far Rockaway. And from all these people and organizations, as a part-time itinerant group worker, I earned $18 a week and got married on that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was lucky. I got a full-time job at $75 a month from the Greater New York Fund to work with solo clubs. This was 1938 when I was married, and I then started to attend the New York School full-time. Mm -hmm. What kind of clubs were those? These were the solo clubs where so-called um, young adult delinquents behaved, and uh, we were able to socialize them. This was the uh, turf where you had gangs, violent gangs, shootings. There been some novels written about that. And I was an outreach worker. And the first such one that the Great New York Fund uh, um, um, subsidized through the uh, Jewish Federation of New York. As a result of that job, I was a solid club worker, the day camp operator, and director of the uh, Intermediate Youth Division, all for $75 a month. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you the vim and the vitality and the excitement and commitment I later learned was a great attribute in putting up with the other hardships that faced me along the way. Right, right. When you finished uh, getting your what, master's degree at the uh, New York School of Social Work, where did you go then? Well, it was the master's degree. At that time, the New York School wasn't recognized as a graduate university. 
a later associate after I left with uh, Columbia. Uh, I had a diploma to social work. Mm -hmm. When I, I received that, after I already started to work full time as a caseworker in the Jewish Family Service, where I was doing my casework, the field work placement, that was the functional agency. Oh, I see, all right. And the education there was tremendous because at the time, Herbert Aptekar was writing his book on basic uh, social casework. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the, quote, guinea pigs through whom and with whom uh, he uh, tested out all his concepts and material. Mm -hmm. And that was an education in advanced uh, functional social work. Uh, at the same time, I was doing other part-time work in the Jewish centers and then started to work as a volunteer in the Selective Service Board. The war had broken out. Mm -hmm. And I was responsible for a sector in Williamsburg, New York, uh, in terms of those who requested special uh, exemptions. Mm -hmm. So I was a social worker on the board, trying to establish the validity requests for exemptions. That was a very painful task. You were helping to decide uh, who went and who didn't go. Mm -hmm. And that was a very fearsome uh, situation mm -hmm. because the war had broken out. Remember 1939, the Poland invasion by the Nazis? It spread throughout Europe through, uh, I think it was 1941 when Pearl Harbor finally broke the American uh, um, passivity and full world war broke out. Uh, I stayed with the Jewish Family Service uh, as a caseworker, intake worker with people of great skill uh, who I was fortunate to know, like the late Bob Gomberg, uh, mm -hmm. Shep Sherman, and Dr. Ackerman, great minds, and my supervisor, Ruth Fisday, was a great person. I think she's still around in New York, mm -hmm. and I think I'm sitting here because uh, Fisdale took me on as uh, one of her um, students and then workers, and she helped me to discipline myself. Did she give you some help in reconciling the functional and diagnostic uh, schools that you were being exposed to? I don't think she helped me. I had a sort of um, struggle with that. I don't think I ever solved that either or situation until I came to Canada. I found the solution in Canada, uh, and of course I've written about this extensively. I moved beyond eclecticism to existential casework. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm one of the pioneers in that. Uh, not yet recognized because I've written extensively. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine um, writ has written a book on uh, existential social work. But I think we're more honored in the breach than in recognition. Although Francis Turner has a whole chapter on that in his book on theories of social work. Mr. Weiss, I'm not a caseworker and don't know mm -hmm. much about it, if anything. Can you explain briefly the difference between the two kinds that you're, you're speaking of? Well, um, in the diagnostic approach, the so-called Freudian dynamic approach, we did a great deal on understanding and diagnosing how the past influenced present behavior and relationships. Uh, it became a form of uh, archaeology into the past of the individual very deep, very extensive, eventually to result in the transference between the patient and the therapist or caseworker, which would lead to the recognition inside of the part of the patient or client as to what had led him to behave this way or her, and they would renounce the negative childish behavior to become more mature and live uh, greatly on their own. I'm not opposed to that idea. It's a re-educative tool. However, it encouraged dependency great deal of transference, and it took an awful long time. Mm -hmm. The functional approach says what was, was, and the past is only useful as it is determined by how you say it's been determined. We know it's there, but we want to know where you're coming from now, where you're going. This led to brief service casework, the ego casework. In other words, the I is more important than the id and the superego at the mm -hmm. moment, all of which were Freudian concepts. Um, I'm into the field which says uh, the people are what they are because they're responsible for themselves and must consider how much of self-deception and group deception has blocked or perverted their awareness of their realities. And mine is a re-educative tool, but it assumes paradoxically when you're in need of help, you're also capable of helping yourself if I can release that energy.
-hmm. It may sound the same, but um, at best all of us are trying to understand other people. We are mirrors, and I like to call casework back with fortune tellers. You mentioned earlier that you're uh, writing a, a script. Yes, uh, well I'm writing really a, a, a fictionalized autobiography which attempts to say what Soren Kierkegaard said, the famous existential philosopher who said, in effect, life is lived in the present but only stood looking back. Mm -hmm. Just as my discussion with you will have much more meaning when it's over and I begin to think what happened, what ought to have been said. Now, this backward fortune telling is just what we do in casework. Mm -hmm. You come in need or in pain, and I try to understand, and I ask you to fill in the gaps. How did you behave in similar circumstances? What was it like with your parents, and your siblings, and your other partners, in your work life, and your love life? We're looking backward. And based on that is when clients said, you're telling me my fortune for the future. He said, if you understand the past, why you feel about you do, now we can say what might be the best way of going on. Quote unquote, I would say that's casework mm -hmm. in a sort of oral sense. Mm -hmm. I hope uh, it's clear. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's, uh, it's clear to a certain extent in my mind, but like you, it'll, I'll have a lot to think about after the interview is over too. I'm struck uh, by the way in which you have apparently, and I'm sure we'll, you know, I'll, I'll lead you through on to your, your later career in, in a few minutes, I'm struck by the extent to which you apparently have combined direct service work with clients with um, a philosophical look at what you've been doing. Right. Um, I'm not even quite sure what to ask about that, but I find it a fascinating combination. I think if you recall, I was interested primarily in literature. And even as a child, I had the experience because of a great friendship I had with another person, a friend of mine who is a self-taught writer, great breath and width. He's now uh, writing in New York on, of all things, aviation. Dick and I used to write. At the age of 10, I had written a book of poetry called Pots and Pants, which I try to express the feelings I have. I find that I have that cast of mind. Mm -hmm. And to, to a great degree, my Canadian experience helped me uh, think through a lot of these things. Because I went into social work really, as I said, on a contingent basis. Necessity, opportunity, my being there, it happened, fine. And then I recognized it was more than a career, a means toward uh, earning a livelihood. I don't think I've ever done as well in uh, social work as in business, so my business leaders told me. But I found in that the ability to integrate my search for the truth with a sense that I had really embarked upon a secular priesthood. You see, in my family background, there are religious functionaries, rabbis, and so on. And though my mother never thought I would turn into a rabbi, I was such a modernist, with the latest uh, information of the new world that she had come to, which bewildered her. But nonetheless, I find in what I do um, the kind of work that a priest was supposed to do. In short, what I'm saying after 40 years in the field, that we are moral philosophers in action. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to say some of this, by the way, and that's perhaps why I've published a number of books. I have one book on this, uh, not as well said perhaps as I would like to, but I put it out in 1975 at a point in my career when I felt I had to sort of integrate some of these points. So I wrote Existential Human Relations, which tries to say this in some narrative form. And then I've written four books of poetry to explain this emotionally through image. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps uh, someday I'll have the opportunity of uh, having it read by social workers generally. A few have used this in their courses. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate to try on some of these ideas at a number of seminars where Swithin Bowers of the St. Patrick's School of Social Work invited me to uh, talk on these subjects. And I've published extensively in the journal, both in the Canadian Association of Social Work and in Intervention of the Quebec Corporation. Mm -hmm. So that I met the minds and the uh, fields of interest here. And because Montreal is at the crossroads between North America and Europe, particularly French philosophy, I came here and through being here met 
Jean-Paul Sartre, the whole post-war existentialist school, and becoming absorbed with that, trying to understand why human problems are really not soluble. There are no problems in human life that are soluble. They're only endurable. We say that's how we solve it. We learn to endure and minimize the pain. We never solve any problem. So is that the job of a social worker then, is to help people endure? Well, I would say coping is endurance, if you stop to think. And we're not playing games of semanticism, because we see people in great pain and suffering who manage to endure beautifully. Look at the post-war Holocaust. Uh, victims who've made new lives, however the pain is there. Mm -hmm. Look at people with all kinds of functional organic difficulty who are quite creative. They've sublimated pain, they've endured it. Mm -hmm. And the philosophy of existentialism says that, in a sense. And I moved from, let's get back to the first thing, diagnostic psychodynamics through to functional Rankian ego psychology to existential psychology or social work, which integrates it. Mm -hmm. Now you can move from any one of those uh, <coughs> methods or perceptions, really how we look at information that comes in, find a way of relating to people comfortably. If you feel that your role is to listen carefully and to heed what's being said publicly and implicitly, and respond to it in a way that's appropriate sometimes, paradoxically, sometimes with amusement, sometimes with empathy, sometimes even with resentment and rejection. That talks about a lot of the modern theorists in the field. Uh, Jay Haley talks about that, uh, some other existentialists talk about that. I think we're in a very changing uh, theoretical approach. It's a reality-based and philosophically-based approach. Mm -hmm. I found that very possible and helpful in enduring the role of, or roles I thought I had here in my job in Canada and the imposition of roles that I didn't realize I was assuming when I came here, if not for that philosophy which integrated my own approach to my responsibilities, I don't think I could have endured. Mm -hmm. I think I tried to sort of put mm -hmm. it together. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't sound integrated, but it helped me cope. <laughs> No, it sounds as though you've, you've co quite consciously um, searched through philosophy uh, and looked at your practice as a social worker and made the two fit together with your responsibilities as a professional. Yes, it was essential and then it was desirable and then I enjoyed learning it. Mm -hmm. So that I looked for the great code that animates human relationships. Mm -hmm. The kind of great code that uh, Christopher Fry did recently when he wrote on the Bible as mm -hmm. the great code for language and fantasies and storytelling, and not only man's relationship to God and God's relationship to man, but man's relationship to other people. Because mm -hmm. we're all really groping for a moral and ethical lifestyle that makes it possible to accept and be accepted, to live and let live. What is social work? It's not only an integrative thing or an adjustive thing, it's really a lesson plan for life. Social work as a lesson plan. As a lesson plan. It's a guideline, not only to help those who have fallen by the side, but also give you a mental health approach, also give you a kind of understanding of yourself and others that makes life more pleasant, less painful. We say, there but for the grace of God go I. What do we mean by that? Mm -hmm. Well, we're saying, there's the lesson. If not for that, I might be there. And so by being involved with people, Again, the reason for social work being a highly desirable field of practice as I got older was that I could see myself if things had happened differently. What would have happened had my parents stayed in Europe and the Nazis over in their village? Would I be a survivor or have been one of the victims in the concentration camp? What if I had not had this education and this experience? Would I have been a, a merchant, an enterpriser, this, that, or other. Who knows? Mm -hmm. It's not a question of what if. By seeing others with whom I empathize, I can wear their shoes even temporarily mm -hmm. and itch where they itch and scratch where they scratch so that I can feel their humanity. Mm -hmm. So I was able, take for example, uh, being involved in taking care of other people's children. 
being involved as I was uh, with the adoption program of the Institute and the Jewish Child Welfare Bureau. And we not only played God in deciding who was to get whom, a very uh, terrifying experience that you have to learn to cope with, but I literally was a godfather, or for a time the substitute parent, because in law I was the subrogate tutor for all these children, so legally I was considered to be the father substitute. Well, damn it, I wanted to know what happened. Mm -hmm. I felt involved, mm -hmm. though I only had, unfortunately, only two children. By extension, I had several thousand children mm -hmm. in my career. Mm -hmm. And everywhere I go, former clients, former colleagues or students, I'm involved with a lot of people's destinies. I don't need to know how they've turned out. Only one person might know they themselves. But I have a feeling it's continued. That's been my gratification and perhaps less uh, uh, material than it might have been had I been in the business of helping to make profit. Well, can't have it all. Mm -hmm. But it, this, this um, understanding of why you did what you, why you did your work and the way in which you did it, um, providing not only, not only a rationale for the way in which you did your work and whatever effect it might have had on people, but also, it sounds to me as though it helps you understand your place in the world. Oh yes, or without not, question. Not only, not only this world, but the, the broader spiritual world as well. Yes, and my place in the history of mankind. I think, frankly, that helping others primarily, however objective we are, helps us. You have, have you seen the title of my latest book? What is what? <laughs> helping You Helps Me. Oh, well there you are. Uh. We all come down to the same understanding. If you're kind and you're sharing, it tends to uh, come back. I like to say, um, uh, this is a sort of catchphrase, uh, you remember there was a stone in some graveyard where the saying was, uh, what I never had I never got, what I never got I never shared, what I never shared I never kept, a sort of solemn uh, resignation that uh, failure being left out, I've converted that to say what I got I had. What I had I gave, what I gave I shared, and what I shared I kept. Mm -hmm. That's the positive way of mm -hmm. making a monument for yourself. And I think in the still silent recesses of the social worker or any professional, that is in the end the thing that makes all the other pain and discomforts bearable. Mm -hmm. You notice mm -hmm. the birds, the adverbs are bearable, endurable, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the purpose of social work. I hope people endure better. Mm -hmm. You give me a lot to think about. Um, I want to return now to to more specifics about your work, if I might. Sure. Um, the uh, you worked in, in uh, uh, Jewish family agencies for a number of years, what, 1937 to 1947, was it actually? Uh, interspersed with uh, two years in the Jewish Community Center. I left Brooklyn uh, in 1943. Mm -hmm. I had been through the casework as a student, 38, 39, 40, 40, 40, 40 at the Jewish Family Service of Brooklyn very experienced but not well paying. My daughter was already here and the only opportunity to improve myself was to go from an $1,800 a year job to a $3,000 a year job, which at that time was tremendous. That was offered by the Rochester Young Men's Women's Hebrew Association and I very comfortably moved over back to group work. Mm -hmm. I came from group work and I'd become a therapist and casework. I worked for two years at the Jewish Young Men's Hebrew Association in Rochester, a beautiful town, and I was in charge of day camp, and I was in charge of the youth division, I was in charge of this uh, dormitory residence program, and ran the first uh, trial by youth, which was written up in a magazine, where the children, the young people at the time having trouble with repressive uh, attitudes of adults, we ran a great big public trial by youth in which we challenged the adults to give proof why they resented young people. It was a great way of acting out, as Marino was to say, a group therapy thing on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. My group work experience has always been helpful in this, both in teaching and 
staying in front of the public and trying to facilitate interchanges. Mm -hmm. It also gave me a great deal of experience of standing before an audience. It helped me as a teacher. Because when I started my career, I used to stutter, believe it or not. It certainly isn't a now. No, no, no. Now I'm supposed to be uh, impossible to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, see. Especially you ask. Well, in any case, <laughs> right there, I decided group work was not my <coughs> baby. I wanted casework. I loved the hermeneutics of casework, exegesis, and interpretation. And the local Jewish Social Service Bureau had a job for supervised. I went into that. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And then I had another child. And $3,000 a year was not enough, even during the war time. It was just during the height of the war, or just about when it was over. And I started to look around for better positions. The war ended, and the um, uh, Council of Jewish Federation of Welfare Funds, which is the international placement agency, for various fields of social work, asked me if I'd be interested in going to Montreal. Now, I had studied sociology and read a book about the Baron de Hirsch by a professor. I was fascinated with the name of the organization because I used to write to discover absconding fathers and husbands who would go to Canada to avoid some of their responsibilities. It had an illusion in my mind of being something which it wasn't, but it was something unusual. So I went, and I was enamored of the people who interviewed me, and we made an immediate, immediate uh, rapport, and I was hired. I saw them 37 years ago today, and I was here on July 1st. Huh, that's really and that's right. one of the great reasons was a, another Jewish social worker <coughs> from Texas by way of Cleveland, the late Don Hurwitz, was here, and he persuaded me to come. Mm -hmm. I came here with my family ostensibly for three years. I stayed here for 37. Although not with the Baron de Hirsch Institute Jewish Child Welfare Bureau, which I merged in 1950. There are two agencies in one, really five, because I went on to take my part in Canadian life. That was a turning point. Coming to Montreal? Yes. Mm -hmm. I came around 33 years of age, uh, young family, uh, I was on my way up in the, finally, the executive ranks of Jewish Communal Service. Mm -hmm. and, but I was young, and other people in the field were maybe a few years old, and the opportunities would not become available for the next 10, 15. I was ambitious. And my ambition blinded me to some of the problems that were staring me in the face. What were some of those problems when you came to Montreal in 1947? Uh, a different cultural value system. Uh, we came from New York, highly developed, uh, cosmopolitan, uh, Rochester, where the professionals in Eastman Kodak, Xerox, were recognized as the skilled experts, where the Reformed Jews, a very modern form of Judaism, were in the uh, leading elite. I came here. The professionals were questioned. The laymen, the self-made men and women, were in charge of everything. There had been an experience in Montreal where, for about 40 years, there was no professional Jewish rabbi. There had been some problems. They were just getting into understanding modern technology in the marketplace, in the factory, in the, you know, high furnace industries, and of course in merchandising. And here I was full of beans, a New Yorker, full of energy, and I saw the old habit of giving relief directly, operating a clothing room where people would be lined up and clients would have to be paraded, the case committees that knew the names of the clients, the unmarried mothers who made decisions on adoption, all of which meant confidentiality was questionable. And these were case committees of volunteers? Volunteers. Mm -hmm. And I walked into a situation where some people were trained, some weren't. There had been an interregnum of leadership where you had a split set of agencies. The Baron de Hirsch Institute, which had fallen into disrepair because it was the relief giving arm of the Federation, which it had created, side by side with the Jewish Child Welfare Bureau that prided itself in being modern because it had closed the Montreal Hebrew Orphans home 
I was using foster care, but uh, didn't want to deal with the family agency. I came to coordinate both and integrate them with all the rivalry and factionalism. And I walked in, you know, like uh, into the Algae and Stables like it wouldn't matter. I could do it overnight. It wasn't that easy. And lay people who wore different hats but controlled the same uh, uh, tycoons and uh, business leaders ran everything. They just went from meeting to meeting with different agency names with the same leaders and had different interests. If they were the fundraising body, they wanted to save money for the service agency. How could we do it with less expense or how could we do this differently? It meant I had to start professionalizing. Very painful thing because there weren't very many professionally trained Jewish social workers. The good ones had gone elsewhere, gone to the States. It was a big brain drain. I'm the first of the reverse of the brain drain. Or the school was not considered on the same par as Chicago or Pennsylvania or New the York. McGill school so That's right. Mm -hmm. It had also fallen into a slump. It was a sort of side water. The great changes weren't to come until the next 10 years when Montreal and Quebec uh, opened up itself to the post-war world, the winds of change. I was part of the winds of change. I was, as Alvin Toffler said, I understood later, part of the future shock. Mm -hmm. And so from a personality point of view, I am a gung-ho character, full of energy. I'm accustomed to breaking through the line, my football scrimmage experience, my commitment my, I would say, uh, perhaps bravado. I wasn't afraid. I had such confidence that I, you know, sometimes pushed instead of followed. Or sometimes uh, made demands that weren't yet accepted because of the emotional blocks people had. Nonetheless, a crisis of such overwhelming importance, unfortunately, came to pass. And it helped create the circumstances the life experience where we had to dialogue, professional laymen, resolve conflicts, learn to accept each other. We had to deal <coughs> suddenly. I came in July and was then notified with the agency that we had been appointed by the federal government through the Canadian Jewish Congress to act as the reception agency professionally for the release and reception of 1,200 war orphans, refugee youth from the post-war world. Well, that was like Moses descending from Mount Sinai with the new commandments for cooperation, modernization, administrative house cleaning. Suddenly I was given, if not carte blanche, I was given the freedom, go ahead and do what you think is necessary. Mm -hmm. Because in two months we set up reception centers, we trained, we, we hired untrained but positive people, conducted our own, what was to be Later done in community college paraprofessional training. We wrote the man I wrote the manuals. I trained the group foster home. I had done this kind of work. Uh, we lined up lay people into teams of, for mass foster home finding. And we received, I think it was September 3rd, the first shipment by plane of 40 refugee young people. We were to receive 1,200 of these people. 500 out of whom stayed on in Montreal, but between 47 and 52, then there were adult refugees, tailless furriers. The whole agency went through such modernization to cope, mm -hmm. to know how to deal with it systematically, <coughs> administratively, mm -hmm. record keeping, uh, supervision, uh, working not in the customary way, but reaching out, having to learn different languages, having to cope with the whole gamut of life. Mm -hmm. Well, our position as a leader in the community was refurbished, but fallen into a slump too because the most important agencies in all of the Institute had a very honorable experience in history, which I came to write in the centennial year in 1963, in the books available. Suddenly, the agency and its leader were, were accepted. <coughs> the proof were in the children, really adolescents, who had come and been within two years absorbed and integrated the Jewish homes here and throughout the country. One of our greatest refugee children is the great John Hirsch of uh, Stratford. Mm -hmm. And he will tell you what that experience meant. But we were the first to receive all these people. Mm -hmm. So when, when that occurred, you know, just after you'd been here a very short period Three of time. Three months. Um, 
This was a new function for the agency? Well, it was part of a so-called old function of doing child care, the Jewish Child Welfare Bureau, which was merged, mm -hmm. and which required all social workers. It was no longer you did this function, that you were a caseworker. This was a priority. And in doing that priority, they learned to carry mixed caseloads, which was the multiple function approach, mm -hmm. which later led to the integration of the agency with just departments. Mm -hmm. And actually, I had been brought here uh, at a salary that was, uh, at that time, great, $5,000 a year. They absorbed two separate directors at 3000 each. It was a bargain. Mm -hmm. See, five for six, or six they for five. They got a deal. I learned that later. Oh, they had a deal. <laughs> yeah. Things changed rapidly because in dealing with this reality, we had to cut corners and see what was superfluous, dead wood, stupid ways of operating that had come down in the past. For example, it was a clerk in the Federation that countersigned relief checks. Who was that person? Very quickly I showed him techniques of how to uh, proof and secure your checklists so that we expose stupidities without finding too much resistance. And with the help of other professionals like uh, Don Hurwitz I mentioned, a new director came with the Jewish Vocational Service who was trained. We developed a core of trained people who reinforced each other. Mm -hmm. And then the laypersons began to realize this was good administration that could be adapted to their own operations. And the accountants were interested in the systems we introduced. And even the mechanization, very shortly on, I got rid of individual dictaphone machines, for example, things that are taken for granted now in hospital. By introducing the PBX system, we pick up a phone and dive yourself into a mm -hmm. machine and talk at ease, just like in hospitals you're talking into mm -hmm. these machines wherever you are. Well, all these little developments were taking place, and uh, we integrated the personnel practices, we developed case committees with functions, we revised the bylaws, we changed the name of the organization, we became one for five, because all of them had funds and bequests. We were known as the Baron de Hirsch Institute Jewish Trial Welfare Bureau. I discovered, for example, that I was responsible for the operation of a community cemetery. Now, unless you're a secular priest, this is foreign and unacceptable to any trained social worker, anywhere. Anywhere in the world, no social worker is responsible <coughs> for the operation administration of community cemeteries. There are 53 different helping groups that own their property and we administer the land and so on. We operate a private and a public free burial program so that Jews who are indigent can still have proper Jewish burials, mm -hmm. religiously approved. I was responsible for that. So I got involved with the spiritual religious problems and that's a story in itself. It's fabulous if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Now, being able to show that what I recommended and stood for made sense economically, expeditiously, it accomplished these goals, and in two years you absorbed 1,200 kids. That's unthinkable. Mm -hmm. And by comparison with the European Jewish Children's Aid of the United States, for whom I had been a caseworker in Rochester, they got about less than half as many we were as effective as them with all their technology and all their highly trained paid people. And we showed we could train partly educated and mature people and we laid the foundation working with McGill School of Social Work for what is now case aids and community college things. So we pioneered out necessity and demonstrated in practice. And that built goodwill and I think also a support system for myself. Yeah, that was one certainly one of the questions that occurred to me as uh, the, the, the new man in town. Uh, you're, you're a foreigner, uh, uh, brash perhaps, or with bravado, I think is the word you use to describe yourself. Um, uh, was it tough at some times to I think, go on? Uh, I forget the name of the systems writer. Uh, I was the cosmopolitan, they were the locals. Uh -huh. Now, any community, any organization, corporate body, community, the cosmopolitan is the the disturber. The locals have customary grooves to work in. You come in as the outsider. Not only in fact, but from linguistic, cultural, technical sense of the word. I realized that. But I figured I was only here for three years. And my colleagues in the States were very impressed. They, lots of them thought I was foolish to come here. 
I quickly published in the uh, Journal of Social Casework. I ch published here. I was always publishing what I experienced, and good or bad, understand what I did. And I was getting some recognition because I was invited to the executive committee of this conference, that conference, and very quickly was accepted by my colleagues, fortunately, in the Protestant and the French communities. They saw me not as a threat, but as an asset, and I was involved in interagency work in the Council of uh, Agencies at the Red Feather. Uh, Quebec looked upon me with great uh, interest and acceptance. Uh, some of your present ministers were vetted by me to go to the Graduate School of Social Work. Mm -hmm. And Jean-Claude Morin, for example, mm -hmm. with his pipe. Uh, I represented for Columbia the agent for which people were interviewed for entrance. And I suddenly became very active with the Quebec government of social welfare and so on, and uh, was able to get grants and recognition and led the agency to a very, very uh, critical decision, which was of great anxiety producing things. This happened somewhere toward the end of the 50s. I had recognized that as an agency without walls, we received from the Quebec government and the Montreal Welfare Department one-third of the relief we gave to clients. We were an institution without walls. There was no public assistance agency. It was all through the church or voluntary agencies, if you recognize, unlike today's things. And all Jews were protected. We lived in somewhat of a ghetto. That was part of the problem. They were inward-looking. They had learned to adjust to Montreal's deep cultural freeze but interacting and sharing and utilizing public services is a frightening thing. That's why we had our own institutions, our own free school, our own free library, our own uh, tuberculosis sanitarium. I came along and said, look, we have a lawyer on staff. <clears throat> These clients are getting basic welfare. The case loads are so large we have to begin to specialize. Why can't we take those who are getting basic maintenance relief from us and being used as the vehicle, go back to the city and say, here, carry them, and the casework part we'll do. Mm -hmm. Well, all the big shots, all the leaders said, my God, risk sending these people to the unknown, mm -hmm. to the government. Mm -hmm. See, the idea of the government in the first generation is in Russia, they can throw you into jail, they can sure. punish you, and so on. I said, why not? We're here. If they mm -hmm. need casework and consultation, the move into public service agencies, public welfare, which was coming anyway, mm -hmm. was so anxiety producing that I trembled to see whether my support system would support me. They did, because nothing really happened that was adverse. Sorry, did you say they did support you? They did you? support me because yeah. the people went, got their relief, and if there were other casework problems, came on with us, but we didn't have to do that mechanical job. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question of clarification yes. here? Mm -hmm. um, relief is uh, often used in the sense of being unemployment assistance. Are you using it in that sense? Or I'm using it, yes. And I'm using it in terms of money, money to live with. Not, not only for the unemployed, the unemployable, but all. That's right. And whoever had a need, sometimes supplementation. Okay. We supplemented the low income people, elderly, single parents, refugees, uh, immigrants, people who had. Remember, been uh, impoverished by very expensive medical care. Remember, mm -hmm. until the middle 70s, everything was voluntary. And if you didn't have the means to buy your medical services and hospital insurance services or whatever, you had to borrow till you were terribly impoverished for more than one generation. I found that to be the cause for a great deal of poverty among the Jews mm -hmm. of Montreal. Anyway, this move, which took place toward the end of 1950, was of course not done automatically and without apprehensions I mentioned, but brought a number of self-studies and outside experts. And we have the famous Silver Report of a colleague from Detroit who was brought in a very knowledgeable savant in the field who went through the agency's operations and said, yes, that was a good move. And the reason for that move is we were going into family counseling. We had to get professional people, and as you know, highly trained people don't want to talk touch money, don't want to give money. Hardcore problems are not for them. They need ego satisfaction. And so we moved in, unloaded this caseload, then moved into the other caseload. This is part of the professionalization. Mm -hmm. 
And very quickly they began to recognize that psychiatry was a part of the helping process as a tool. We developed with the Jewish hospitals, community psychiatry department, joint training for their psychiatrists in the agency as field work, and also to have immediate access to diagnosis and treatment facilities and placements. We developed the first group foster home in Canada. Having given up the institutions, we innovated in the late 50s uh, a program for group care. Mm -hmm. which is now fairly common. And we've, of course, built up our visiting homemaker service, which had been a trial run financed by the National Council of Jewish Women. We gave up our summer camping programs because we no longer had a congregate uh, institutional group of kids for whom we needed a summer camp. We gave our money by sale to community camps. In fact, this was the important role of the Baron of Hirsch Institute over the years, and we can spend some time there if you like. But on the whole, I would say, uh, by 1963, the 100th anniversary of the agency, which required tremendous social public planning uh, observances, a great, great show we put on, with newspaper ads, a book published, uh, outside visitors. It's really a, a classic piece of, uh, of celebration. Remember, we observed our 100th anniversary four years before Confederation observed the centennial, or centenary. Well, by that time I understood where I was coming from, what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. By that time I had highly trained supervisors, professionally trained people had become an agency to come to, and uh, I'm pleased to say a number of my former students, fieldwork placement and colleagues are working in all the agencies to this day, and, and to this day, and I'm really carried forward and adapted what they've learned uh, from us. It was a very meaningful experience. Now, as I stayed on, and I stayed on because, if you were to ask, I met George Davidson in Ottawa. Great man, also interested in literature, Dr. Davidson. He had his PhD in literature, was an important uh, mover and shaker in the field of the family allowance, for example, the Department of National Health and Welfare, was a deputy minister for many years. Uh, one day in the 50s he said to me, because I was busy with the, the Council on uh, Canadian Welfare Council, mm -hmm. uh, what was his name? Uh, oh. Dick Davis. Dick Davis. I was one of his uh, protégés. I had a big mouth, I wrote, I spoke, I went to conferences. George said to me, how would you like to represent us, the United Nations, UNESCO? Terrific. Like that. I thought I could move now into other circles. <clears throat> Called me up, he says, you're still an American citizen, David. Oh, I said, I can be corrected. I naturalized myself. P.S. The party lost to Diefenbaker. <laughs> <laughs> I am not uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I became... Cause and effect, right? Cause and effect. Uh, but the decision to naturalize myself was not just to become politically acceptable, but also because I'd reached a stage of knowing that this was going to be place. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that for a minute? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm a former American myself and I have some interest in how people decided, came to the decision to make that change, but thinking about the time at which you came to Canada, 1947, and the subsequent decade probably, that <coughs> decade of the 50s where there was a tremendous economic growth across much of the country and yet tremendous repression, political repression. Uh, what was that like in Montreal at the time for you as a Jew and as an American? Well, <clears throat> I'd come out of the east side of New York. I'd come out of a cosmopolitan experience in my university and graduate training, especially in Rochester. I'd seen different lifestyles and been in the homes of different people. I decided very early on that all this was out there. I never had an experience face to face that I couldn't cope with. I used to walk through Harlem on the way to City College and the way home to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Never was afraid, maybe because of my size, my cocky this, my bravado. I'd learned always to stand up and fight back. That was inculcated in me to survive. When I came here, I broke the ghetto. I reached out in order to find other people to learn from and to share. So G.B. Clark at the at the Federation at the uh, uh, family service, successes, Gwyneth uh, Howell at the council, 
uh, Dick Davis, people in Stuart Sutton, Eric Smith, well, they were very accessible if I reached out. I reached out to Quebec City. My first experience as the secular rabbi, I was told by the uh, religious people, the Board of Jewish Ministers, that a very serious uh, sin was being committed against the Jewish dead. It was up to me as the leader of the institute to correct it. What was it? Uh, Jewish men and women or children who died in test state and without anybody to claim the body would be, according to the Coroner's Act, turned over to a um, graduate school of medicine as uh, for anatom anatomical studies. This is a sin against religious scruples. I went to uh, Quebec. I found out who the deputy minister was. I had a long chat with him and explained that you're Jewish or Catholic and life as in death for the afterworld and to cut them up is a sin. Sure, we made the exception. I came back. They said, how did you do it? Magic. I, didn't, I wasn't afraid. I went and explained it. And they were reasonable. Yeah. And so the uh, undertaker was advised whenever a hospital or institution or whatever, even the uh, uh, prison had a Jew or Jewess, they would be called and we would provide the burial at cost to ourselves. Mm -hmm. To this day, that rule exists even though Jewish doctors are angry. Mm -hmm. Enough bodies available. Mm -hmm. Now that was an important internal way in which I demonstrated to my leadership and I was able to break through those walls. Because of these things with Quebec, I became a persona grata, because I was not a, an Englishman, I was not a Protestant, Catholic, Protestant, English, French. I was a Jew who spoke different languages and was also part of a minority that wanted to express itself. In 1900 and what was it, 58, when Israel was proclaimed, they saw themselves as seeking their own Jerusalem. I was very much persona grata. So they called on me to help them in departmental matters. I reciprocated mm -hmm. by making demands of them. And in later years, you see, I became a member of the Superior Council of the Family, the only Englishman Jew of nine commissioners for many years, because I was persona grata for other things. And then when the Social Aid Appeal Board was created in 1969, Again, I was one of nine commissioners appointed by Castanier and Barras's government because I had the civil service connections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, that means that while other things were happening, we had some kind of uh, middle ground position. We, you as an individual? I and the agency I represented. Mm -hmm. It's true when it came to taking Canadian, then the Canadian Quebec problem rose. I never realized that it existed, by the way. That's a part of my naivete that I learned after becoming a citizen of Canada that I ought to have thought about, or maybe I should have thought about differently, because until 1975, I never had to learn a French word. All my French colleagues and uh, friends spoke English, were happy to speak English. Mm -hmm. Would write or talk to me and visit me, and I'd visit only in English. Mm -hmm. It was only after Bill 22 of Barassas and then Bill 101 that I suddenly died and they died to me because mm -hmm. I was not Francophone. Mm -hmm. But until that time I was, as I say, persona grata. Mm -hmm. I think finally that they were responsible for my getting awards. Uh, the Centennial Medal, the Queen's Coronation Medal came from being nominated by then. No one in the Jewish community nominated me. Mm -hmm. and that too mm -hmm. was part of my uh, credibility, I guess. It was nice to get, but I never thought I would. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating for me to think about how your, um, your, uh, your uniqueness uh, allowed you, and I think that's the right word, allowed you to make a contribution to Canadian society. It was not because you were a native-born Montreal Jew that you were able to get these things done. And it wasn't because you exhibited many of the qualities that social workers hold dear facilitating, understanding, listening, um, self-effacing, perhaps, that you were able to get things done. It was because you were different yes. that many of these things were possible. I think you're right. My difference coupled with my know-how. 
Indeed. Yeah. They wanted that know-how, and I was very glad to share. <laughs> I got more back in return. I learned a great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, I started to teach the things I learned doing these things. Mm -hmm. It gave me information I didn't necessarily have in this specialized area of agency. Yeah. I was able, but you're right, but that helped me also integrate in the community. I never felt unwanted or alien. I felt welcomed. Hmm. People wanted to talk to me, wanted to get my opinions. I was on a million committees at one time. Mm -hmm. I didn't mind going to the committees. I didn't mind listening. And that's how I learned about Sartre. Mm -hmm. and about the French uh, philosophies after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Remember I said early on I had the split between diagnostic, functional, so on? I started to read and study and talk with people in that community. They were very knowledgeable. They read it. And I was able to test out these things. I reached out. Of course, I was lucky also to hear Will Herbert on one of his visits to Montreal at the Hillel House on a weekend when he opened my eyes to Martin Buber. I didn't follow Jean-Paul Sartre. It led to the third great rabbi in modern history, Martin Buber. The other two great rabbis are Freud, of course, and Karl Marx. And I think Martin Buber is for social work. Their great connection from Freud, no, from Maimonides to Freud to Buber, Historically speaking, are the three great seminal minds for social work and any healing profession. Hmm. That's how I mm -hmm. found out. And this work and this interest, I think, finally propelled me to face up to whether or not I would die in my job at the Baron Hirsch Institute. Okay. okay, Mr. Weiss, when we left off, we were uh, you were talking about your role, your uh, experience at the Baron Hirsch Institute, and during the coffee break, you were mentioning to me a number of things about the way in which you saw yourself as a social worker and your role at the Baron Hirsch. What, how, how did you see yourself operating during those years? Well, in the beginning, I saw myself as developing a system of operation with uh, system management, clarification, organization, and uh, dealing with crises brought about by these historical changes of war orphans, merging two somewhat antagonistic agencies, uh, establishing uh, the identity agency as a service agency, not only for the poor or the outcast, but for all members of the community. In other words, a post-war rehabilitation job. When that job was accomplished by the middle 50s, and I determined that I wanted to make other changes, I realized that the Institute represented more than a technical expertise. Historically, it had always played the role of community leader, social action, social change. And when I prepared for its centenary in 1963, and studied the history in the archives, I realized I was in the footsteps of lay people like Lyon Cohn, of the famous dynasty of Cohns, many of whom still wear, and uh, the great grandfather of the singer troubadour Leonard Cohn, I realized that when people called upon me, I couldn't hide behind professional one on one practice or one on group internal practice. I had enough confidence in the people who were working in the agency and their dependence or independence with my leadership that I could move on. So I worked with the Council on Agencies. I got involved with governmental committees and commissions. I even got involved in television work. I became a public speaker on behalf of the agency, its program, and other related causes. And before long, with my chutzpah or bravado, I wasn't afraid of going to Ottawa when called upon for special consultations or going into international experiences. Uh, and it seemed that the agency welcomed that. You had to be visible, and I had to be visible during the war orphans uh, crisis. I had to represent and model the leadership of how people would be received, placed, protected, given an opportunity to rebuild their lives. And you couldn't be a pussyfoot. There were many strong problems. Now, my other experiences luckily stood in good stead. I already explained to you, for example, how with bravado, I went to Quebec to save Jewish cadavers for Jewish burial. Internally in the community, there were a lot of religious uh, taboos about the agency's secular operations, because Montreal was basically 
a kind of offshoot of Vilna, Poland, first generation religious Jews. Here the Reformed congregation is at the bottom of the totem pole. It's the orthodox observers. The situation arose for many years, it's still going on. Babies released for adoptions were usually placed in non-Jewish homes because the empathy identification didn't result, as we had discovered, in Jewish foster mothers keeping, wanting to keep the baby. They were raising the baby until it was released, two months, three months, six months. They wanted ownership, and it was difficult to separate. Whereas a Jewish baby, a non-Jewish home, obviously, it could be taken out when we had the adoptive home. Well, this got to the attention of the Canadian Jewish Congress. The rabbis were very angry at the agency, and I was called before the Din Torah, a Jewish court. Accused of being the leader of an organization that was threatening Jewish babies and perhaps allowing a recurrence of what happened in Germany, I was asked to give an account. How could I be a Jewish communal leader and social worker if I permitted that? The excuse that Jewish families were not forthcoming was not enough. I accepted the reality and reminded them, however, in Jewish history, that placing Jewish babies in non-Jewish homes did not necessarily mean assimilation or loss. In fact, the greatest uh, leader in Jewish history, the greatest prophet we have ever known, was placed and raised in an Egyptian family and turned out to be Moses, the lawgiver. <laughs> so they said, well, that's okay, but you remember his mother used to come and breastfeed him. I said, that's true, Jewish social workers supervised the foster homes. Uh, that, I would say, was not necessarily a great victory, but it was a standoff. And this represented also my role and the nature of the community. When I came here, I recognized as a cosmopolitan that the local mores and attitudes, ingrown feelings, traditional lifestyles and values meant that I would have to understand and relate to them. Gradually polishing them, modernizing them, but because I understood, whatever the reasons, the nature and the sources of those concerns, I was able to respond to them without further alienation. Mm -hmm. And so I was released to go on other things. I felt, gee, I had a contribution to make here and there. And then I found teaching was the thing I loved to do. Mm -hmm. Because now I could return what I had learned. I guess that's another reason people go to social work. The life of the mind doesn't die. You've got to use your mind. So one thing led to another. And uh, I decided to come out of the closet. And around 1963, I realized that uh, I had reached the watershed in my life. I had been here from 47, 16 years, and my children were older. Uh, and I said uh, to my wife, what do you think we should do? We thought we'd leave. Well, there were very few opportunities, or I was overqualified. Uh, social workers, according to my wife, are white-collar okies, they're migrant <laughs> workers. And I didn't want to be a migrant. Montreal was lovely. 1963, the drums of a new drummer were not being heard yet. Duplessis was there, Lesage was to come, uh, Levesque was to come. The whole um, reappearance of active, radical National Socialism was way off. It didn't seem to exist. We decided this was a nice place to really settle down. The children were happy here, they were bilingual. We had a position, although we were not a native, we had established uh, a role in our synagogue, our temple, our friends, our colleagues. It was a good lifestyle. Even though the relatives said, where did you get lost? Because Americans looked at Canada, you know, as just the, uh, the tundra and the Royal Mounted Police. Well, at that time we said, look, maybe there's another career Maybe there's another kind of lifestyle. Maybe you should do more writing and teaching. And so we said yes at the right time. And so we decided the right time would be when my first grandson was born. And Philip was born in 1970, and I retired in 1970 mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. almost 24 years. I retired in 1970. Things had changed. I was now commissioner of the. Uh, 
Social Aid Appeal Board, working in the canonical law of, jur of little jurisprudence, of setting uh, new kinds of uh, juridical rules and regulations about the rights of clients to ask and appeal decisions of bureaucrats and social workers. That was the revolution I'd always worked toward, the mm -hmm. right of the client to speak up. It was in the law. By that time, we saw, and I'd seen coming in 1963, what eventually became the nationalization of the social services and the health agencies. I did not want to go public. You didn't want, uh, you didn't want to be I didn't want the agency rich. to become a public establishment. This is where understanding the history of the agency I saw, it had done everything the public institutions said they would do. We met needs from conception to the resurrection, unmarried mothers to burial services. We already were running as a house of the people. All social services, all kinds of needs, group work, education, whatnot, all were being provided. And I said to the board, my experience in the States was, if you took money, you had to pay the piper. And you'd lose autonomy and your social cultural entity. 10, 12 years later, this is the situation now in Quebec. Mm -hmm. As the social service center, the Jewish Family Services, may be divested of all of its functions or relegated to second class position or made part of one social service center, according to the law. Mm -hmm. And local community service center is now being groomed to take over the casework services. And if it hadn't been for my successor, uh, who understood some of this, he's now in Texas, we continued the Baron Hirsch Institute. We made a deal with the Federation. It became a Murano agency, a private institution, mm -hmm. quietly standing by. We did not liquidate all the agency. If some of our friends outside the rest of the country and other communities want to know, we maintain the Baron Hirsch Institute, and now as the government is cutting off and divesting its social service center of some of its functions, traditionally done by the Institute, the Institute's coming back and justifying what I myself had said. You know, sometimes you get to be a prophet in your own country, sometimes you don't. I'm sorry to say that it's happening, and it's happening not because of budget controls, it's happening because of Mr. or Dr. Camille Ron's attitude. It's everything in French is good, anything else is second class or mm -hmm. has to adjust to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that situation is going to go on, mm -hmm. on, whether Barossa comes or not. But that political situation was not foreseen in 1963 or when, 1970. When you, when you came to Canada and, and shortly thereafter, uh, you've mentioned to me a couple of times the, uh, what you observed as the, I guess, the three solitudes. Um, yes, yes. French Catholic, English Protestant, and the Jewish community. I would think four, because the Catholic was split to English Catholic, French mm -hmm. Catholic. That's mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. We had four solitudes. Over the years, uh, and, and thinking what you've just told me about the involvement of the state, what happened to the four solitudes, and how were you involved in what happened? Well, professionally, I was immediately involved through the Council on Social Agencies, at least with the English, Jewish, not too much French, and the English Catholic. So we had three solitudes working together on committees, on joint common grounds. And we negotiated with government for grants and so on. And then we got to know each other and began to think of some of the reform activities we had to get involved in social change. And that was precipitated by the fact that, you know, the self-help groups, the Greater Montreal uh, Committee for uh, Underprivileged or Poverty Committees, you remember these self-help mm -hmm. groups? Well, there's a lot of that action following Saul and his visit. Saul is another kind of Jewish secular priest prophet whose impact was tremendous and with whom we spoke common languages. I had some of that kind of attitude. And my youth, my uh, uh, ability to breach the language walls somehow in Quebec, my easy access in uh, Ottawa, uh, they figured they'd follow along with my energy. Mm -hmm with some envy, because the attitude has always been that Jews seem to know what to do and they've been doing it so well. Well, obviously, if you've been living in diaspora for 2,000 years and saving the poor and the wanderer and the transient and the uh, pogrom victims, you develop know-how. Even if it's not professional know-how, it's in the blood. And occasionally some of my colleagues would say, oh, gee, I wish we were like uh, 
had your means. I said, very easy, convert. You have the means and the history. Yeah. Yeah. Because on the other end, they asked me, why don't you become a Catholic? You speak with the voice of fire. I know the French word, voix de feu. I said, fine. I said, uh, what do you want me to do? Become a Catholic. I said, look, you have one of us as a Catholic. Things haven't changed yet. 1900 odd years. When they do, I don't, we'll need to be Catholic, Protestant, Jew, we'll be people. Mm -hmm. Well, that's my rabbi's favorite statement. So <laughs> be a better Catholic, Protestant, and a better Jew, things will be okay. Yeah. I think I've lost you. If you just put it back on the silver part of the, um, uh, the microphone, it'll go back in quite well. Put the bottom of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that explains it in a lineal logical way because oral history never gives you the chance to you know get the proper sequences but I lived in a multi-dimensional world I discovered most of us well even in New York and different agencies highly specialized complex it was very difficult to be multi-dimensional you had to do your own thing here you could work in a variety of fields each of which reinforced or flew out of each other or grew out of each other why was that possible here and not in New York, for example? Okay. A, because it was a smaller community, however, and more intensive. And because we had the solitudes, a lot of this was going on in here. Everybody was involved in a variety of things that came in trying to adapt, and then you moved into it when it opened up. Somehow we were bridge builders, mm -hmm. prospectors, explorers, discoverers. I have it somewhere in the poem about Montreal, you know how we come to belong, walking the streets, looking at the sights, and how you suddenly become part of this feeling. And uh, I think I got my kicks out of it, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you, you finished, uh, retired from the Baron de Hirsch in 1970. You had been teaching at McGill for some years. Uh, I've been teaching part-time as a lecturer, primarily in the field of social administration. Mm -hmm. um, when I retired, I had a few things in mind teaching, not part-time, full-time, private practice, uh, development of my gerontology interests. I had been teaching that at Concordia University, then known as St. George Williams, and I thought I would just free myself. Luckily, my children were grown, my wife was modest in the right demands and expectations, and as if all things happened at one time, McGill was in a, a budgetary bind. Didn't work out. I went to Dawson College as one of the things I was interested in, new community college development here, you know, part of the universal salary of education. And I was offered a variety of jobs, and Sister McDonald said, How would you like to develop a program of community recreation? Fine, that's group work in another way. I said, Sure, what do we do? She said, Well, here's the cahier, do whatever you can. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I'm, in, I'm able to take nothing and make something out of it because that's what the existentialist believes in. We come from nothing. Ex nihilo, no, how does it go? Ex, ex nihilo creatio, from nothing creation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I pronounce it in Latin. Ex nihilo creatio. Creatio ex nihilo, from nothing to something, from something to nothing. Mm -hmm. So I just fell into this part time and created a department that's going through gung ho. Mm -hmm. Great. We developed a form of paraprofessional group worker, center worker, camp worker, geriatric clinic or hospital worker, a person go out and do his or her thing, whether it's teaching arts and crafts, music, or leading citizenship reactions and the social change agency. Well, that's all part of my background. I was able, luckily, to get the right colleagues and the students went from two to a hundred odd a year. And, clamoring to get in. That was great. And mm -hmm. I did that within five years. Mm -hmm. By 1975, we had been certified as it. And American teachers and experts were writing to us and coming here and interested in our graduates. Went on to get their masters and their PhDs at Springfield College. So what we were doing was not just limited. It, we were able to get the right people. That was very gratifying. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do that only. I was also on the social ed appeal board part. And then I got into a commercial enterprise in uh, pre-retirement counseling where I was the senior consultant, counselor, and wrote pamphlets and book booklets on preparation for retirement. 
one of the results of which I now teach social gerontology at a community college, adult education. I write a weekly column in a local newspaper on retirement plan. Mm -hmm. So you see one thing led to another, utilizing all these things. So I found that I was doing much better financially when I left the institute than I was working there after 24 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. That made me realize now that in the world of concrete materialism, what had happened to me? Well, this is where I am. Mm -hmm. It's a question that makes me wonder, looking backward, what was it that made me satisfied with lower middle class professional status, financially speaking? That's what Montreal meant. Mm -hmm. uh, its pension funds, the public funds were late in coming. United States, you had the Social Security Act in 1937. We only got it in 1966, 1967, mm -hmm. etc. Well, we have Medicare and uh, universal hospitalization, which is very good. So I asked myself, how was it possible? Now I understand. I started with very little an East Side immigrant, first generation child in a large family. And to have enough to eat, pay the rent and clothe yourself and have holidays was the great achievement of the middle class. My children don't think so. My grandchildren don't think so. Some of my colleagues don't think so. Mm -hmm. There's some things I can change and some that I can't. Mm -hmm. And I remember what one of my great tycoons said, David, with your brains and your mouthpiece, you could be a great asset in the business. And I said, well, why did we sign a contract? He said, you're too much of an idealist. So the assets that I had that he recognized were not attributes to make money because I somehow gave it away for nothing anyway, and he couldn't quite trust me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the personality deficiency, mm -hmm. a blind spot. If I would do it over again, I might do it again, but with a little more adroitness, a little less exuberance, a little more selfishly, mm -hmm. but I'm afraid it would be the same result. Would your would you, would your motto be the same? Um, what I what I got. What I got, I had. What I gave. Yes, that would be pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. um, but I would make investments. Mm -hmm. I would not think that my life here would be transitory. I would have borrowed money and bought property, mm -hmm. as some of my colleagues did. I would have, knowing my knowledge about programs and so on, um, did the normal thing with friends and relatives, which I didn't do. What? Well, steered people to things, advised them with program developments, whether it would be business connections. And let's face it, everybody in community service who is a volunteer is there for self-development, mm -hmm. self-fulfillment, and self-aggrandizement. Mm -hmm. And as long as we realize these three parts are indivisible, we don't understand the volunteer. Is that different for us as professional social workers? I think we tend to sit on our self-aggrandizement, the self-development. We want to achieve. Mm -hmm. We want to practice. We want to be recognized by our peers as knowing, mm -hmm. as doing, mm -hmm. but not in the material sense. If we're good fundraisers in Federation work, and fundraising, and we're able to correlate it. Mm -hmm. But I never went into fundraising. Yes, I could raise money. I go to the Quebec government and get fifty thousand dollars for a group fast home. Nobody else thought it possible. Mm -hmm. You see, by simply saying to the minister, uh, "That's how we got our group fast home." Incidentally, the minister of welfare, a man named La France, great guy, very religious, couldn't say no to seeing me and the head of the agency big businessman. And we sat there for two hours in his office and he was being told by the deputy something new. And nothing was happening. And on the way out I said, Mr. Minister, may I say a few words? He said, sure, what is it? I said, Mr. Minister, there's a destiny that makes us brothers. No man goes his way alone. All that we send into the lives of others comes back into our own. He said, stop. Hold it. Rang his secretary. He says, say it to her. I said, he says, bring it back to me. He said to us, sit down. 
He said, I'll give you $25,000 for this fiscal year and $25,000 next month, the beginning of the new fiscal year. I got my $50,000 by that quotation. <laughs> now, that kind of money raising, that kind of almost uh, showbiz technique, I could do mm -hmm. if it was for you. But somehow I didn't feel it appropriate for myself. Mm -hmm. That came out of my childhood. Mm -hmm. Don't grab this eight people, nine people. Be modest. Don't expect. The, you know, it's risky. So yeah. for them, maybe that's how I sublimated my repressed. Um, one used the phrase, the Freudian phrase, wish by tra sublimating on the other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm wondering is it. Um, one of the questions that I, that I neglected to ask you earlier, Mr. Weiss, was about your involvement with the Professional Association, the Canadian Association of Social Workers, and it's... Right. Uh, very early on, I was very interested. I remember Joy Maines. Uh, I started to write for the journal, book reviews. I think there's some articles there. And then when the Corporation of Quebec Social Workers started, you know, there was a parturition there for a time. I became very active in the local corporation. I was on the executive. I edited Intervention for several years before it went all French. You lost your contact list. Oh, yes. I, <clears throat> just go ahead if you like. If, if it doesn't work, uh, you know. I've been on committees uh, with the, as I say, the Canadian Association until uh, 1970. After that, I was no longer directly in a professional role, but mm -hmm. I maintained my membership. And then the corporation had come into the uh, situation very strongly, as if to say you can't be a member of both. Uh, I carried on here what I did in the United States. I was on the executive committee of the uh, uh, Conference on Jewish Communal Service for many years, sat on the executive, I was on the board of editors. So I've been involved a great deal in that. In fact, even to this day, I have book reviews published there. I have articles published there. I'm very active in the uh, intervention of the Provincial Association. Mm -hmm. But in the Canadian Association, I think when Anthony Gray was the director mm -hmm. and the editor, he was the last of those. You were, you were saying, uh, Mr. Weiss, that uh, the last you had to do with CASW was when Tony Gray was executive director? Right. I think that coincided with the time that I was still with the Baron shortly after. Um, I think I was active with the various Canadian conferences, had sessions, gave papers. I was involved in lecturing in St. John's Newfoundland School of Social Work. I went out to Calgary on two occasions to give some seminars. And I've been fortunate, I've had friends and colleagues throughout the country. Mm -hmm. So that I didn't feel uh, neglected or unknown or unwanted. And that's very important to have a sense of belonging and uh, of concern. Mm -hmm. So I felt it my obligation and joy to be part and parcel of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still have some of those ties, and I find that my roots with the American leaders are still strong. Mm -hmm. But some of my colleagues and former students are directors and agencies throughout the United States, mm -hmm. and we're in constant communication, right. either by letter writing or by audio tapes. Yeah. We are terribly involved, and that's mm -hmm, good. Mm -hmm, indeed. I, I'd like to ask you a couple of retrospective questions, now, sure. uh, more abstract perhaps than we've been uh, so far. Um, one of which would be that after, as you look back on your career, uh, 37 years in Canada and some years in the United States before that, um, accomplishments, things of which you're particularly pleased or proud that you've done. Um. Well, an early, uh, the earliest accomplishment was when I won my first declamation, declamation contest in the Y as a child. Second was learning to go before an audience in the, in the little theater groups to learn to overcome my shyness. Um, the leadership experience that expressed itself in high school when I became president of the general organization of 3,000 students. In other words, leadership was being felt. When I met and married my wife, my children were born. Those are peak experiences. It's social work. And they're related, by the way, to social work. All these things show themselves in the kinds of things I grew with. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, how, how so? Take well, one as an example. Uh, when I got married, I understood marriage counseling much better than I was not married. <laughs> when I had children, I understood parent-child problems at different ages and stages, which paralleled my life. Mm -hmm. If you look at any expert, they generally parallel their own lifestyle changes and so on with what they're doing, whether you're an artist, or a therapist or a social worker. Mm -hmm. Okay, the big achievement in the United States was when, as a fieldwork student, I was tapped on the shoulder and said, Would you work full time before you graduated? Mm -hmm. That was the accolade that made me realize that maybe I had something. I didn't know what it was, but I could pitch in a big time. Then going to Rochester and taking on some of the social problems there, instead of, <clears throat> you know, talking, I acted out on a group therapy basis, the trial by youth. I would consider that the best thing I did there. It certainly settled a lot of feeling tones and curfews for youth were taken away. Kids were trusted more. They could trust their elders. We acted out and, as Marino says, we got rid of a lot of that anger. In Montreal, many things. I would say the most important thing in social work that I've done, I made social work credible and more acceptable professional. I know this because I have various awards for recognition. I think also I modeled certain kinds of social work, which I call engagement. I was engaged. Again, my existential philosophy. If you want to be realistic and you want to be part of what you're doing, you cannot be over and above it. You have to be in and of it. You can be in and of the situation slightly above, but you can't be above it without being separate. That's a very hard practical thing, but I tried to exemplify that without knowing that I was doing it. Mm -hmm. So the accomplishments here was to revivify, redefine, reorganize the Brand Irish Institute, Jewish Child Welfare Bureau, to bring it to its, I think, paradigma paradigmatic excellence by 1970, when it went public, it had everything that the public agency was supposed to do, became a model, because it had already been doing it. When I went into full-time teaching, I was able to create, out of nothing, out of no previous experience, a whole department of recreational leadership and leisure counseling. Well, mm -hmm. that came out of my own experience. I thought that was an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Publishing my poetry was an accomplishment that flew out of my, or grew out of my social work belief that I have to be true to myself. I didn't have to be a closet poet or a writer. And so I became active in the literary field game. Mm -hmm. And finally, I was able, by the help of God and a good wife and family and friends, to live to the day that we could say, we have a prayer, blessed art thou, Lord of God, King of the universe, who has brought us forth to live and see this day of our lives. We call it Las Manhazer. I can appreciate that somehow social work achieved the most important thing for me and I in it, to give me a, a lifestyle and understanding, not the greatest wisdom, but an understanding, I'm looking for the wisdom still, of what it is to be a human being in the 20th century, besieged and beleaguered by some of the greatest dilemmas a man has ever experienced self-destruction on a global scale. Mm -hmm. A planet that's almost overtaxed. Um, it is the best of worlds, it is the worst of worlds. It's the season of good things, the season of bad things. The tale of two cities is really the tale of two worlds. Mm -hmm. Social work lives with these divisions, these separate solitudes. And what is social work? Reaching out. Touching, caring, breathing, isn't it? Isn't that the definition of what love is? Mm -hmm. Love of social work is practical love, applied love. Now, Hugh McLennan has written a gorgeous novel about Quebec and Canada called Two Solitudes. And he has, as the opening theme, this poem by Maria Rilke, Rilke which says, Love is two solitudes, meeting, reaching, uh, reading, touching, and caring. Well, isn't that a definition of the functions and processes of social work? 
social workers and poets, great lovers, as such we're big risk takers. And we can be betrayed, we can be misunderstood, we can be almost a little overwhelmed by what we do and are. But having an existential attitude which understands the two parts, the duality of life and the duality of feeling, love is hate too if we don't watch out, we learn to cope with these two things that are indivisible, not separate, indivisibly, our dual natures, our dual society. Well, that's what social work achieved for me and has achieved here. So we learn to live with our Jewishness, with our Canadianism, with the Quebecois demands, and we're coping. I don't think I would leave Quebec because we have Mr. Levesque. In spite of Mr. Levesque, if I disagree with him, I'll stay. Mm -hmm. Now, that is, in spite of the enemy or the, the demons, I will not run. I'm not calling him a demon, but, I mean, this is what the uh, Sartre calls it, or Buddha. Uh, the unspeakable thing needs the singular response of the individual. I think this is when you help people who are hurt in pain, whether it's cancer, or bereavement, or a new society, a refugee status, alienated, is to know that that person has a singular answer mm -hmm. and a singular response to be found in aid that makes his situation or her situation bearable, culpable, even if not truly understood. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's what I think social work did mm -hmm. and what I hope to contribute or have contributed to mm -hmm. social work. Yeah, I feel sure that uh, that you've made, uh, your contribution has really been immeasurable. You know, well, I think that was a good peroration for the end. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to add? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I could add a great deal. <laughs> I could tell you how uh, when I first came here, people would say, I remember now, you don't talk to Weiss unless you're prepared for a psychoanalytical interview or treatment. And I would say, well, how do you come to say this, it would come back. Someone came to say they have this interest or need, and I'd say, fine, um, tell me about it. <laughs> I didn't say, sure, Dan, let, you know, I wanted to understand. Well, trying to understand those days was considered by the locals, he's putting you in the chair. Now, one of the greatest professional leaders in Jewish communal service, well, I'll tell you, the Executive Vice President of the Council of Jewish Federations of Welfare Funds, Mr. Carmi Schwartz, who is uh, the outstanding Jewish leader in North America, is a next Montrealer, mm -hmm. was doing his field work next door to me, was the man who said to me, David, why do you psychoanalyze people? He himself was afraid that he would reveal himself. That's what they feared, revealing. I believe that revealing is healing. Not revealed help is a, a physical, material a transaction. But if I help you materially or by advice, or whatever, it helps you because you have been revealed to yourself that part that was obscured. Mm -hmm. Now that was called analytical, frightening. I then understood that I was the cosmopolitan Therefore, I developed some of the <coughs> St. Catherine Street attitudes, you know, of saying, you know, telling the joke or making it seem casual, because that was the game that was being played. Never reveal your feelings. It was dangerous. Mm -hmm. But, you know, true help means you're vulnerable. And if you really want to help, you have to understand you make yourself the other vulnerable. So I stopped psychoanalyzing. Okay, on that note, perhaps we can close it. Sure. I'd like to thank you very much for your time this You're afternoon. Quite welcome. And Did you get Swithin Bowers? No, he's in Portugal. Portugal. Get Father, what's his name? Oh, he's going to. Cavanlock? Cavanlock. He's in Montreal. He's in Montreal? Oh, he's retired, right. Yeah. Did you get him? Mm hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. good. He used to come to the house, my kids would say, Why do you call him Father? Does he have children? I said, Ask him. He said, Sure, I have thousands of children at St. Pat's. Yes, I'm glad you got these here. If you want to pick one up, the one that you think would, with a great memory.
And I think I'll take that from over here. Excuse me. With that as a background. Uh, okay, this one. One uh, second. Uh, a few others are. Uh, this is uh, okay. a seminar. <laughs> that exists. Oh, I got it all. <laughs> I'll get this one here, then I'll go in uh, the other place. Whoopsie. You all right? Yeah. You want some of my artwork? Some of my own paintings and drawings? Oh, sure. Are you sure? One second. I'll just uh, get the camera going there. Okay. I received the Queen's Coronation Medal uh, in 19. Uh, I think I was nominated by the Quebec government for it. And then the uh, July 1st, 1967, I received the Centennial Medal, um, nominated by someone in Ottawa. Some of these things. And here I have hidden an award from the alumni and staff from Dawson College for uh, my uh, momentous contributions over the past decade. Enlightenment of the hundreds who have been exposed to his knowledge and wisdom. A rather flattering inscription. Enjoy is um, the presentation inscription there when I retired from the offices and board of the Brandehurst Institute. And uh, the award of honor, which I received at the centennial celebration of the Brandeis Institute, that was a little nepotistic. I was uh, one of the co-signers of that award, <laughs> so I decided to take one for myself. It's on mankind encircled. A little sort of poster that suggests what goes on. And the footsteps around the edge. What's right, it? you saw it. What? what? You saw uh, the chosen by any chance in the movie? It's a book and mm -hmm. he reminds me that uh, enamored and intoxicated with God, you live the world and bring some of that joy. Mm -hmm. That's what he's done. It's mm -hmm. almost a dance step. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I did thought that was a guy. Yes. Oops. Well, you see, there's one other book, but I haven't got it in front of me. Where is it? Now, this was a book published for the McGill School of Social Work uh, called Principles of the Administration of Social Agencies, and it was a manual with which I taught classes there on the subject. In 1963, I wrote and edited the Centennial Yearbook of the Baron Bahosh Institute. Um, and that year, I published my first book of uh, verse called Advice Not Judgment, and in 1975 published Existential Human Relations, followed by uh, three books thereafter, uh, 77, The Human Quotient, in 1980, Engagement, Quebecois Haiku, and uh, 1982, Plots and Portents. I think you will notice that these illustrations are pretty much generic, and they are because they are the work of Stanley Lewis, the uh, artist and printmaker. And I think they illustrate some of the themes in these books. 